fire is one of the four classical elements in ancient Greek philosophy, along with water, earth, air, and the fifth element is ether. Fire is considered to be both hot and dry, and according to Plato, is associated with the tetrahedron, which is a triangular pyramid. In one Greek myth, Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to humans, but was punished for it. I've previously compared Prometheus to Lucifer, the light bearer, in prior videos, and in this context, fire is symbolic of resurrection or rebirth as well as intellect and reason, or knowledge, and this includes an inner knowing, or gnosis. In most Wiccan traditions, as well as schools of mysticism and Freemasonry, fire has a dual nature and is present, for example, during the ceremony of winter solstice and represents creation and light on one hand and destruction and purification on the other. Many of the esoteric schools of thought in the contemporary occult community were influenced by the Golden Dawn, or Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, to differentiate it from the political party in Greece. And it was a secret society during the 19th and 20th century devoted to the study of metaphysics, paranormal activities, and ceremonial magic, spelled with a K, the type made popular by Aleister Crowley. The founders were Freemasons, and the organization was based on a similar system of hierarchy and initiation, like one finds in Masonic lodges. However, women were admitted on an equal basis with men. The stated goals were spiritual development, and the order taught esoteric philosophy based on the Kabbalah, astrology, tarot, and other forms of divination such as geomancy, and inner members were taught more esoteric practices such as scrying, which might be called fortune telling, astral travel, and the real alchemy, which has nothing to do with transmuting metals. In the higher levels, spirit communications were said to take place, which were considered to be with supernatural entities known as the secret chiefs. While some followers of the Golden Dawn tradition believed that the secret chiefs were not supernatural beings, but rather symbolic representations of actual or legendary sources of spiritual esotericism, which found its way into the teachings of the Order. Others insist that they are indeed discarnate entities, that is to say, conscious beings that do not occupy a physical body, which dictate and direct the activities of the organization. For those that do not believe such things exist, another possibility is that the members enter into a trance state during or following prolonged sex rituals in which parts of the subconscious mind is accessed and information is retrieved in that way. In any event, the Golden Dawn was well established in Great Britain by 1900 and its membership included many celebrities, as well as Aleister Crowley himself. Other notable members included H.P. Lovecraft, an American author most famous for writing in the horror fiction genre, forbidden knowledge, and non-human influences on humanity. Race is the most controversial aspect of Lovecraft's legacy, and were he alive today, I'm sure all of his work would be censored and unpublished. Another rumored member was Bram Stoker, a famous Irish author best known today for his novel Dracula. Charles Henry Allen Bennett was a member. He was a friend of Aleister Crowley and best known for introducing Buddhism to the West. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was a member. He was author of Sherlock Holmes and there were many others, especially authors and those in the arts. 
The grades or levels of the Golden Dawn were based on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, but the same or a similar model was used one or two centuries earlier in Germany, where Rosicrucian ideas flourished from Hesse in the north to Bavaria in the south. The modern German occult revival owes its inception to the popularity of Theosophy, a religion established in the United States during the late 19th century, founded primarily by the Russian immigrant Helena Blavatsky. Her slogan was, there is no religion higher than truth. And while her writings were based largely upon Asian religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, she was well aware of their common ancient Aryan origins, which also tie into older European philosophies and Neoplatonism, which can all trace their roots, according to Blavatsky herself, back to the mythical Atlantis. That said, the original Knights Templar, founded around 1119, had been a crusading military order that established financial networks across the entire Christian world, including parts of the Middle East. King Philip IV of France stripped the order of its economic and political influence, probably at least in part because he was in so much debt to them financially, and accused the Templars of satanic practices, perversions, blasphemy, and other sins. During this period of time in Europe, Many sexual practices were considered a sin, and this goes back to the Garden of Eden story, in which the fall of mankind was, in esoteric interpretations of the story, due to carnal acts, represented by the eating of the forbidden fruit. I've discussed this already in several videos, and will leave links in the description for those that are interested. These sex rituals were part of the secret treasures brought back into Europe by the Templars, which involved spiritual esoteric knowledge rather than just gold, as they were already extremely wealthy from their banking practices. These occult techniques became the foundation of the higher levels of secret societies, such as the Golden Dawn, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, the OTO, and many others including the Thule and Vril societies, which were established in pre-World War II Germany. <laughs> Rudolf Steiner was made General Secretary of the German Theosophical Society in 1902. Steiner was an Austrian author whose political views were antagonistic to National Socialism. In other words, he was against the Nationalist Socialist Party, yet despite that well-known fact, published these words, quote, The ancestors of the Atlanteans lived in a region which has disappeared. The greatest part of the Atlantean population declined, and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans who comprise present-day civilized humanity. Ever since the mid-17th century, scholars have noted similarities among the more than 400 dialects of the Indo-European languages. Researchers agree that they can all be traced back to one ancestral language called Proto-Indo-European or Aryan. Geneticists compared mitochondrial DNA from blue-eyed individuals in countries as diverse as Jordan, Denmark, and Turkey concluding that people with blue eyes 
share ancestry from a demographic that lived by the Black Sea around 10,000 years ago, spreading out with agriculture. According to Professor Eidelberg from the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of Copenhagen, quote, the first blue-eyed humans were among the Proto-Indo-Europeans, or Aryans, who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. Why is it that this blue-eyed phenotype, which comprises only 6% of the world's population, would have such a great impact on the creation and dissemination of agricultural civilization worldwide? The answer is faithfully rendered in the biblical story of Noah, which is about how survivors from the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, saved domesticated animals used in agriculture, such as horses and oxen, into the Holocene, our current age. Noah was said to have settled on Mount Ararat, which is part of the Caucasus Mountains, where we get the word Caucasian from. For those that do not subscribe to biblical references, please feel free to contact any professor in the anthropology department of any accredited university and ask them why it is that agricultural civilization started so early in places like Mesopotamia and did not, for example, in places like Papua New Guinea or the Andaman Islands between India and Thailand, where there are still isolated native tribes living today in the Stone Age. Any legitimate anthropologist will be well aware of the vital role domesticated animals played in the development of early mass agriculture. And there's only one group of people that retained horses, cattle, and the like, which is why they totally dominated the Holocene, becoming the ethnic nobility and perceived as gods, while other demographics did not. A similar phenomena can be seen during World War II in what are known as cargo cults. This is the true advantage in an anthropological context behind the meaning of the phrase God's chosen people, as I believe that if there is a God, he or she likely loves all people equally, but not all people had domesticated animals following the cataclysms of the Ice Age. So not all people developed and disseminated agricultural civilization equally. That is why statues of gods and nobility, as well as mummified remains from places as diverse as Peru to ancient Egypt, are all depicted with blue eyes and blonde or red hair. That is why textbooks published by the government of Mexico, which can be found in any Mexican classroom, depict their ancient pre-European god as having blonde hair and a beard. The same description given by Credo Mutua, the 94-year-old Zulu shaman that passed away recently in South Africa, who claimed that this picture he had painted of tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed beings had been seen by black African tribes throughout that continent long before the white Europeans arrived. Credo was the official historian of the Zulu nation, and he said that when the Europeans first came, the black Africans thought that they were the return of these same white gods, which they called Mzungu. As a result, they called the European settlers by the same name. This was very much the same reaction as the Central American peoples had when Cortes and his Spanish invasion party arrived in 1519, and they thought that he was the returning god, Quetzalcoatl, another god described as tall, bearded, and blue-eyed. In a previous video, I discussed recent evidence that agriculture existed in the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, and that the skull morphology, particularly the teeth, 
chin, and lack of prognathism of Cro-Magnon types indicated to me that they were likely agricultural. I also associated Cro-Magnon to the mythical continent of Atlantis, assuming such an antediluvian seafaring civilization existed during the Ice Age. That said, almost all known sources that speak of Atlantis, including psychics like Edgar Cayce and occult authors such as Madame Blavatsky, all claim that the ancient Atlanteans were sun worshippers and were known to primitive tribes that they encountered as sun gods. This solar religion kept track of the sun's path, including houses of the zodiac, as I discussed in a past video which I will include a link to in the description section. While this was done for practical purposes, such as navigation and agriculture, it also marked the seasons and times for holding rituals. These same eight times of the year have been translated into the various holidays still observed in many of the world religions and secret societies today. While theosophy continued to gain in popularity, Rudolf Steiner broke away and started a new organization called Anthroposophy. Steiner's orientation was closer to Christianity than the Hinduistic tone that dominated theosophy, but he didn't stray too far, publishing Lucifer, spelled with a Z, in Berlin from 1903 to 1908, and later renamed it to Lucifer Gnosis which devoted a substantial amount to the, quote, sexual religion of the Aryans. Around this time, Guido von Liszt was an active journalist and writer, combining vokish ideology and occultism into a type of esoteric doctrine. The German word Vok is similar to the English word folk. The vokish movement was inspired by the reconstructed traditions of the ancient Germans and this included pre-Christian pagan practices which today are labeled as a cult. Guido von Liszt started promoting his doctrine Arminism after Arminen, which he claimed were the heirs of the Sun King, a body of priest kings in the ancient Ariel Germanic nation or empire. His esoteric religion seemed to have borrowed material from Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism or at least shared it in common, and was concerned with the esoteric doctrines of Gnosis, distinct from the exoteric doctrine intended for the lower social classes, Wotanism. Wotan is the German pronunciation of Odin. Liszt claimed that the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church in Europe constituted a continuing occupation of the Germanic or Aryan tribes by the Roman Empire, albeit now in a religious form, and a continuing persecution of the ancient religion of the Germanic peoples and Celts. He also believed in the magical powers of the old runes, biorhythms, yoga, and Kabbalah, proposing research into the runes for occult insight, which was rejected by academic circles but embraced and financed by his supporters who formed the Guido von Liszt Society in 1908. Members of the Theosophical Society were quick to join, and the organization would influence others, like the Vril Society, headed by the medium Maria Orsic. Another supporter was an ex-monk named Georg Lanz von Liebenfels, who published a lengthy article in a journal for biblical studies in 1903 called Biblical Man-Animal in English, where by a comparative survey of ancient Near East cultures, he detected evidence from iconography and literature which seemed to point to the continued survival into early historical times of hominid ape men similar to the Neanderthal men known from fossil remains in Europe or what is now referred to as Homo erectus discovered in Java. Keep in mind, this is over a hundred years before the human genome was sequenced, and European and Asian DNA 
were found to contain 2 to 5% genetic contribution from Neanderthals, and present day Sub Saharan African populations that trace up to 19% of their genetic ancestry to an extinct archaic hominid species such as Homo erectus that is not found in the DNA of present day Asians or present day Caucasians. In 1905, he expanded his research claiming that ancient Nordic peoples originated from interstellar deities, a concept that is mirrored in many cultures around the world, from Native American tribes to ancient India, and postulated that modern populations are a result of interbreeding between these ancient celestial humans and ape men which he claims is also supported in the Genesis chapters of the Bible, where it discusses the sons of God mixing with mortals. In the same year, Lands commenced publication of the journal Ostara, named after the pagan Germanic goddess of spring, and the following year founded Ordo Novi Templi, or the Order of the New Templars. On August 18, 1918, the Thule Society was formed, and it combined elements of the Guido von Liszt Society, the Order of the New Templars, and identified with Wotan in triple form. And this concept can be compared to Hermes Trismegistus and the basis of Hermeticism, which I covered in a video and I'll also include that in the description. The name Thule's from an island located by Greek geographers at the northernmost extremity of the world, and according to their mythology, it was the capital of Hyperborea, a legendary country supposedly in the far north polar regions, originally mentioned by Herodotus from Egyptian sources. Some have equated the Hyperboreans with the survivors of Atlantis, who were described by Plato, again, following Egyptian sources. Supposedly, Hyperborea split into two islands which were considered to be the center of an advanced, lost civilization. Friedrich Nietzsche began his 1895 work called The Antichrist with, quote, Let us see ourselves for what we are. We are Hyperboreans. This notion of an antediluvian civilization from the North Pole region that predates Plato's Atlantis is mirrored in the writings of Bal Gagadar Tilak, who wrote a book called The Arctic Home in the Vedas, where he makes the argument that the ancient, sacred Indian Vedas could only have been composed in the Arctic, and that the Aryans brought them south after the onset of the Ice Age. This idea was shared by many occult mystery schools and esoteric religions, as well as by Maria Orsic and the German Vril Society who believed that there were remnants of these ancient civilizations which survived in subterranean caverns and that they ultimately arrived on and later in the earth from a celestial origin. For those not familiar with Maria Orsic, she was a medium who allegedly received communications and instructions on how to construct an anti-gravitic craft which was rumored to have been developed by the Germans during the years leading up to World War II. While there is a considerable amount of evidence supporting this technological leap by the Germans, from reports during the war of what were called Foo Fighters, or floating devices which seemed to defy gravity, to radio broadcasts of actual flying discs, such as the one that hovered above Los Angeles for an entire evening, despite being shot at by hundreds of rounds of artillery, not to mention the reports from the still classified Operation High Jump in Antarctica, where the Allied forces led by Admiral Byrd were said to have deployed a military armada in an unsuccessful effort to locate and destroy 
German bases built deep under the polar ice. So if there's any truth to Nordic populations that live off-world, and if they're somehow related to the ancient Aryans, who during the Pleistocene would have been known as Cro-Magnon, who appear quite suddenly in not only the fossil record, fully developed and fully modern, with not only a unique toolkit, but a unique blood factor to any other hominid on the planet, rhesus negative blood type. If there's any truth to this wild speculation, the question remains, where did Cro-Magnon come from? While the term Aryan is often linked to Ares, which is the Greek god whose equivalent is the Roman Mars, I contend that the term relates to the age of Ares, and that the name would have changed depending on the 2200 year astrological age of the procession of the equinox. So for example, during the age before Ares, they would have associated themselves with the bull or Taurus, as the Minoan civilization did, and so forth. According to Maria Orsic, the home world was actually much farther away than Mars. It was a planet around the star Aldebaran, which is in the constellation of Taurus and seems to be accurately depicted in ancient Cro-Magnon cave paintings as the bull's eye, in between Orion and the Pleiades, in a cave that is sealed off and forbidden to enter. My name is Stoll, Axel Stoll. I'm a doctor of natural sciences. I'm familiar with all natural sciences and look at the problems in its entirety. Are you also Aryan? Yes, of course. I'm of Germanic, Germanic heritage, that's all. My father was a military officer and volunteered to the SS during World War II. He was obligated to have an Aryan certificate. It's interesting, almost everyone was in the military and your family had to have an Aryan certificate. Yes, my father, of course, all military personnel. And that's the reason why I'm quite knowledgeable in military technology. Here is the German flying saucers, developments as you can see. These are the early models, saucer models 1, 2 and 3. And these? These are the Hanabu flying saucers, different models. Hanabu, yes, the name Hanabu, Hanabu. It's of Germanic origin. There's a swastika painted on it, yes, on the initial ones. The moon is populated, Mars is populated by Nazis, and a few more planets. Probably also several other fixed star systems, but that's a guess. But that would mean that the moon and Mars is inhabited by Nazis? Yes, that's correct. The backside of the moon. Have you seen a UFO? Yes, several. Where? Here in the area of Berlin. Several. They perform vigorous aerial maneuvers. The movement. Zack. 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 And they're piloted by the Aryans? Yes, that's correct. So where did the Aryans come from? Presumably, but I can't prove it, from Aldebaran. From that star system. From the star system of the head of the Taurus, 68 light years away. With effects faster than light, it's only a short hop. So the Aryans basically weren't born on this planet? No, not born on this Earth. Well, it was also so-called Vril Society in the Third Reich. And they had telepathic contacts to Aldebaran with the Vril women, mediums. What about the wisdom of the Aryans? Are they more intelligent? How high is their IQ? High, very high. Were there also black people on Aldebaran? No. This planet is a prison planet. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.